John Deere, or was. We just got an update to that. Udo will update you. Uh, Udo has also global overall responsibility for the vehicle engineering and program management of the tractor product families with development locations in Asia, the Americas, and Europe. Udo has been with John Deere since 1999, having different functions with increasing responsibilities. His background is in mechanical engineering with a focus on engineering design and machine dynamics. Udo is going to deliver our keynote lecture, uh, Mind the Gap, the relevance of systems engineering. Udo, the stage is yours. Thank you, Ellie. Um... Good afternoon, everybody. I know it's difficult to come on stage after the Beatles, and of course, it seems like Math Lab is, is the other stones with it, right? So it's a bit of a challenge for me to get you going here today. Um, look at the picture. Why did I choose that picture? Any idea? Keep it for yourself, I'll come back to that. Ellie already said there are some changes coming and I'd like to introduce myself for a moment here. I was born and raised in Northern Germany in a very rural area, farming area, knowing everything about farming. This is my grandfather farming. Does anybody know what happened there? Why he's using a scythe to, to farm? At that point of time, you could also do this mechanically. They got rain, like the rain we have outside today. And what happens is the crops topples over. And you cannot, with the, or they couldn't, with the mechanical systems they had, they couldn't harvest it. So you had to do it by hand. So what this means is agriculture, or understanding agriculture, it was all its independencies to weather, other things, how much you fertilize, how you prepare the soil, and this ingrained in me a systems thinking very early on because you have to think ahead. You have to think what you're doing. Um, but it also ingrained to me, that's a heck of a lot of work. So I decided I don't want to do anything with tractors or agriculture equipment. Boy, was I wrong. I went to school in uh, Hanover. I had a couple of other schools as well. I went to Michigan Tech as well. I have a degree from Hanover as a mechanical engineering and have a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Michigan Tech. This is actually from my school books from 1991. I'm 56 years old before you start counting. So today I would say I studied systems engineering because all of what the things I did where I looked at, but at that point of time, it was not so fancy to talk about systems engineering. It was like, we are mechanical engineers, we're not electrical engineers, we, we, we are more in silos. And over my career at John Deere, and also, if I look at you, you also could confirm that. I think that has changed. There, there are no, uh, there should be no silos. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I think a lot of times we still have those silos. Before I go on, the little update on me. So it says now President Chrysler Electrics. So Chrysler is where I went to, and I've five days, actually four days, five days on the job now. So. Chrysler is, is a company which is a joint venture between Chrysler and John Deere, where we have the majority stake in as John Deere. And we are in the business of developing batteries, immersion cooled batteries for off-road equipment, for boats, for everything but automotive. That's not our business. Um, we're also in the business of doing charges, so high power charges. So the newest one is going to have 250 kilowatt charge power. That's my, my new job. Um, if you want to hear everything about batteries, I probably find somebody in the company who can tell you more than I do. I'm five days on the job. But let's talk about systems engineering. Systems engineering is older than we think. So this is the founding story of John Deere. And if you look at this, what this is, it is really transforming a system an agriculture system, plowing the soil, transforming this into something completely different. Does anybody know what the idea of John Deere was? So his idea or his observation was that while plowing the soil 
gets stuck on the plowshare. Those shears were usually out of wood or cast iron, and the soil was not sliding across it. So he came across a broken saw blade, so a polished nice saw blade from a sawmill, and he took that and banged it into a new type of plowshare. This is actually number three. You can find that in the Smithsonian at Washington, D.C. I think it's not on display there, but I confirmed it's in, the, it's in their cellar somewhere. So this is the number three banged or forged by Mr. John Deere himself. What, what do I want to say with that? That's actually all about understanding the system, observing the system, really looking into what are we going to do with this? What are we going to change? Was he successful right away? No. He had to prove. And this is again something that relates me to systems engineering. So he had to go out and show farmers that this change to his system or change to their system actually is going to work. So he had to demonstrate that it works. And we have to demonstrate that systems engineering is working. Who thinks system engineering is working? Ah, uh, I thought every hand was going like this. Okay, um, 187 years, right? So it's, uh, it's quite some time ago. Uh, and this is Mr. John Deere himself. In those 187 years, John Deere has become one of the oldest industrial companies in the US. Still one brand and only 10 CEOs. I'm not going to bother you with the names of the CEOs, but with just one, and that's Mr. John May. He introduced probably the most comprehensive change in the company, what we have seen, because he moved the company to the next level. But let's quickly step back and see what happened in the, in the last 187 years. So if we look at this, I talked about the plow already. This first portion, so right about to where we introduced the tractor, this first portion was all about understanding hand tools, how the people were mechanically do this work. And then all of a sudden the gasoline engines popped up a new system, no animal power anymore. You can drive the tractor with gasoline. So that had to be integrated and tractors and combines. So it's in 1980, actually at uh, where I came from, from in Mannheim, we introduced it in 1922. So this was the first portion of understanding the systems coming from very low complexity to a little bit more complexity, right? But then the things started to in integrate or become more and more interesting. And as you can see also, what the things we, we brought into life was, was more and more interesting. So in the, up to the 50s, it was all about understanding combustion engines, understanding transmissions more and more. And then, as you can see, John Deere goes abroad. Um, anybody know what happened in 1956? Anybody knows what a Lance Bulldog is? That was when John Deere bought the Lanz Bulldog uh, or the Lanz Werke in Mannheim, Germany. I was actually also starting of, uh, the, the beginning of the end of the, the Lanz brand, but uh, it was going abroad, understanding not only the North American farming, understanding the rest of the farming. But what this also indicates is from there on, all these innovations, what we know today with um, um, tires, before that, the, the, the vehicles just had steel rims and you were just driving on, on steel. You were introducing tires, more complex transmissions. All these components were, or these system, subsystems were introduced into vehicles. In the 2000s, the thing really got kicked off. And as you can see, also John Deere kicked off in the 2000s. We really moved into a new era where we said, okay, we need to understand things a little bit. The last two things I want to explain here, I want to talk about here is 100 years of tractor engineering or 2 million tractors out of Mannheim. Um, that's quite an achievement in less than 100 years. If you think about what we produce per year, this is quite, quite an achievement. And of course, I'm pretty proud of the batteries there. But if you go beyond the 2000s, something happened. And I think this is something many of us know. Cyber physical became the new normal. What do I mean by cyber, cyber physical? Everything on the picture here is connected. So the vehicles in the field, they are connected. We do have what we call a connectivity 
all our equipment is modified and prepared to pump data at a one hertz frequency into the cloud. So we are gaining information of every piece of equipment that leaves the Don John Deere factory and is operated by a farmer. We're get, or not only on, operated by a farmer, also on a construction site, we do have a quite significant construction business as well. So we, are, we have a fully connected fleet. We also have what we call engaged acres. This is the color -y thing there. So the farmers are not only connecting their machines with our system, they're also connecting their farming operation, what they do in the field with what we call the John Deere operation system. So you can actually plan what you want to do there, and I come, come to that in a minute again. You can plan what you do, you can see how much you have harvested, you can see how much you need to fertilize, things like that. So everything becomes connected. This is why the truck is up here. If you do connect things, you can do things like connected support. If there's somebody sitting on the, on the combine and has a problem, doesn't know how to tune and make the combine operate well, they can actually call the service technician and the service technician can swap his screen at the service center with the screen that's on the combine. So it's connected support. These are things that are all of a sudden possible if you have the right organizational setup. And this is what I want to talk about. Smart industrial. So coming from a machine factory to being really a company that understands technology and combines technology. By talking about production systems, everything that's happening by the farm needs to be reflected by our engineering. I show that in a minute a bit. We talk about life cycle solution and we talk about a tech stack. These are the three core pillars of the John Deere business model. Prior to that, we had a global operating model. I come to that in a minute here a bit and explain that a bit more. But the key is really is use the tech stack to enable what has to be on the sustainability side what has to go through all the way through to the life cycle solutions, to the service, what's happening at the customer, and then go, of course, back to the production systems to do the right thing. So let me share one more with you when I talk about production systems. Production systems, and this is just one example of how the production system works. The idea behind that is to understand, and this is why I introduced my grandfather before, the idea behind this is really by the data, by the connectivity, by the operating center, what we use, have all that supported in one basically offering. That's a production system we're talking. So customer usually starts with uh, manage what I want to do next year, what I want to harvest next year, prepare it, make sure uh, everything is really nicely protected, what I've been planting, and then harvest again and understand what I've harvested. Is this the same what I've wanted to harvest? And then repeat the cycle. Of course, this is easy when you're in the US. In the US, we have a significant market share. It's nice to have that, but we have all the equipment. In Europe, that's slightly different. Europe, we call colorful or rainbow equipment. So you have equipment from other manufacturers, so you don't own. what we do as well as John Deere, there's an so AEF, so Agriculture Electronic Foundations. We work with all our competitors to have the same communication between our vehicle and their equipment and the other way around. Of course, if you do John Deere on John Deere, it works perfectly. The other stuff, we'll see. But this also requires a rethinking of how we are organizing. So. Right now, uh, right now, we are organized to what's on the right. We came from what's on the left. So we were bringing the best tractor to the customer. We're bringing the, be we're bringing the best harvester or combine to the customer. That doesn't work if you want to grow, if the customer wants to grow, if the customer wants to have more efficiency, more equipment. Why? 
because the interconnectivity between this is not there. The customer has completely, he doesn't, the customer doesn't want to buy the best, of course they want to buy John Deere, it's the best tractor, but the customers don't want to buy the best tractor, they want to buy the best overall system for them. And that's important, that's something what we need to understand as, as systems engineers. We don't, we're not doing systems engineering because of systems engineering, we are doing it for our customers. Our old approach was outside, uh, sorry, inside out. Think about what you heard in some of the presentation today and what you are doing. It is not that we are bringing our equipment to the customer. It's about the customer is requesting our equipment outside in. The customer drives the requirements. That's what we're after. And I think you all are after that as well, except sometimes we have this silo topic. Okay, this brings me back to my first question. Why did I pick this, bill, uh, this, this picture? Because of the scene, right? Building bridges. No, it's in construction. It's in progress. It's not done. Systems engineering is also not done. We are in process of doing system engineering. You could say, yeah, John Deere has figured everything out. No, we haven't. We have the same problems everybody else has. It's the same challenge. It's people everywhere. It's people who do the business. It's people who do the invent inventions. It's people everywhere. We're using the same tools as many of you. But the key is really, how do we connect the portions we have already built? And that gives us a couple of gaps and a couple of things. And this is why, mind, why I choose the top or the title Mind the Gap. Because there are some gaps I really like to talk to you. Emergence. I think I heard it this morning somewhere in the presentation. Emergent properties, emergence, things, functionalities that appear when you put more than one or when more than two, actually two and more systems together. All of a sudden, you have functionalities you didn't have before, right? So we have an engine, we have a transmission, and we have all this, we know all this, and all of a sudden, you have a satellite navigation system on the tractor. Well, wait a minute. Now I can control where I need to go, how fast I have to go, how well I planned, what my plant rate is, and all this. I put, I put the hype cycle next to it. Emergence is a lot about the hype cycle. You, Anybody know the Gartner hype cycle? Right? Many of your bosses are reading that anyway, right? They're reading the Gartner hype cycle. Wow, well, this is the next big thing. I promise you, most of the things that are popping up there from the technology, from the physical systems, we already know. But putting it together in a different way, that's the essence. And that's the hype that's coming up. Oh, we found out to put things together in a different way. And this is working very well. This is something you need to keep in mind. This will drive a lot of things. This will drive a lot of movement forward. Why did I pick this picture? The tractor is planting. And if you know the tractor and if you look at the tractor, it has a satellite navigation system. What's wrong in the picture? It has, if you look at, at, at the outside of, of the planter, it has what's called indicators. Usually you unfold that, and while you go up, up the, the field, it makes a mark, it's an indicator or marker, it makes a mark in the soil, so when you come around the next time, you drive along this marker. It doesn't need that marker anymore. Well, the customers are still ordering with, with the marker. So it's all about accepting the new te technology, accepting the emergence of what's happening there. The customers still buy this. Most of these things, if you look at the, the plant, is the, never seen the soil. It's all, all brand new stuff, so never change it. Again, emergent properties or emergence is something what we really have to keep in mind. Second thing I like to talk about, complexity. I think I heard a couple of these things today, and there are wonderful presentations today. I'm really, I'm really, I have to say, great selection of presentations, well done. Complexity is not getting less with what we are talking about. Anybody in the room who thinks complexity is getting less? 
if you think about putting things together and understanding things and systems engineering, the cognitive effort we have to put in, and I'll come to that in one of the other slides as well, the cognitive effort is getting more. Manage complexity, and hopefully we get some nice tools to manage complexity. Uh, cognitive effort is getting more complexity. We have to manage, we have to understand that. We have to explain that to many of our seniors, to many of our people. I come to that in a minute a little bit more, but complexity is something that's really growing. Um, the picture in the middle here, the looks like a diamond, is something what we thought and what we think is going to help us. It's going to understand the digital twin so the whole model-based topic and model-based story, but it goes along with the second portion, it's a digital threat. So how you really work in the digital world, how does it go together? And I promise you, you understand this, but most of your managers do not have the experience. It's not because they're stupid. It's just because they didn't have the chance to work in the same world you have been working in. So take your time to explain what you're doing and how it works. Find a way to level this, find an easy way to talk about that. My doctor father, Mr. Harms, Professor Harms from, from Braunschweig always said, explain it in a way that your grandmother understands it. My grandmother was a smart farming, a farming woman, but I, I think I got his point and you maybe got my point too. Collaboration, what's happening here? This is data from 2017, and I apologize that there's probably a newer one there. What's happening? Asia is growing capabilities, and that's fantastic. This is an opportunity for us. It's a fantastic opportunity. China and India will have the largest population of people with higher degrees. This is an opportunity to tap into a resource pool, an innovation pool that we do not have otherwise. So my point is get involved. I've been working with colleagues from India since 2006, with colleagues from China since 2012. Get involved. Systems engineering, by the way, is the way to manage this collaboration. We all speak different languages. Most of us, few of you, are native speaker, native English speakers. I'm not. If I talk to my colleagues, start in China, move to India, go through Germany, move to Brazil, move to Mexico, we all speak, speak somewhat English. But is it the same English? And I think we had that this morning. You said that, correct? When you said, you're Mexican. Systems engineering is the language we are talking, and that helps a lot. Therefore, systems engineering is relevant for the collaboration, but we need to get involved. We need to have a point to get involved there. That's my recommendation for you, and I'll wrap that up in a minute here. Change. Anybody know this curve? You're all experiencing this curve. It's the curve where the technology grows faster and the opportunities in the technology grow faster than the company business or the company organizations we are in. You've never experienced that, right? Trying to explain technology and your supervisor or the supervisor of the supervisor or the board people saying, ah, do we really need this? Oh, this is an investment. Ah, do the others work on this? No, this is a gap somebody else will dive into. If you don't do that, they do this. And we can explain that with systems engineering. We can explain what's in there, but the roles are already changing. And I think it was the Siemens Helsingir's presentation. I really enjoyed that because that presentation said clearly, we can only close that gap if we enable the people to do or to provide the technology or to utilize the technology advancements for the companies we're working with. It's all about people, but be aware of that. The way we have been managed and the way we're managing the people in the future is a completely different game, but we also need to explain that. Systems engineering can explain that, maybe, maybe not. Some people can, can help, uh, can understand what we're talking about. 
Last but not least, the last thing on my list here, system thinking. I stole this slide from a colleague called Christian von Holst. Some of you may know him. Um, where are the systems engineers located in the company? Usually we are tech people, right? We enjoy technology. We enjoy describing things. We enjoy working in tool sets, uh, doing tool chains, doing all this. But that is not enough. I said that before. We need to start explaining what we are doing. Nobody will give you the money for bundle-based systems engineering if you cannot explain what it is good for. That you can manage complexity, that you can um, see emergence before everybody else can, that you can see a lot of these things. So my request from you is talk to the management, talk to the C-level. We have the pleasure that at John Deere, we have a CTO called Jamie Hinman. He's a fantastic, fantastic systems engineer. I believe he understands MathWorks or MATLAB better, better than, than most of the people in the company. Of course, it's a challenge to play in both roles, right? To be a C-level manager, but also be a good system engineer. But he is really a, a big proponent from, from uh, systems engineering. So to wrap this up, Emergence, watch out for emergence. Something very, very important. Things are coming up. Things are will be collected or connected in a new way. Like I said, you can connect the machine to the cloud. You can read what, what the machine tells to the cloud. You can see what the machine is doing. You can see, oh, wait a minute. I think we should maintain this kind of, of, of hydraulic pump because it loses pressure over time. Let's talk about that. Let's call this. Repaired his own car. Some of us, right? Try to repair a Tesla yourself. It's not that we are stupid today. It's just different systems. It's a complex system. You don't have the tools to do this. In the good old days, you, you, had, you had your hand tools and you could do almost everything. So complexity is something really, really we need to understand and of course, the tools we're using, whoever, whoever supplies these kind of tools. And of course, we heard from some two big suppliers here. Tools are important to help to manage the complexity. Collaboration, like I said before, get involved. It's a chance. It's an opportunity. It's a great way of managing. aware of what that means. It's the effort you have to put in to create something, to come up with something new. The change, our businesses are going to change slower. The organizational changes are slower, even in John Deere, are, are slower because it's people. I, it was also, I think, in the presentation of, of the Siemens Health Engineers, people have to, uh, have to be taken along. Silos have to be broken down. I think there should be no silos anymore. And then of last but not least, system thinking at every level. Like I said, we are lucky. We have uh, Mr. Hinman as on the CTO who explains a lot to the rest of the group. But systems thinking is something what we really need to introduce. With that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Is this on? Yes, this is. So thank you very much, Udo. Uh, what a nice way to, um, to kick off our afternoon sessions with your talk. I couldn't help but notice so many um, synergies between your talk and the keynote that we had in the morning. And yeah, I think there is hope because then they are, we are not very far from scientists, uh, the practitioners. And I think that's, uh, that's yeah. noticeable. A comment to that. So some of the younger people will ask you what to study. And you should get up and say, systems engineering. What else is there to be in the world? Am I wrong? 
It's the coolest job you can have. Am I wrong? <laughs> yes. So it's it's about starting systems engineering from the beginning. Feels a little bit odd for us. We feel we should excel in a in a certain trade, whether it's electrical engineering, whether it's mechanical engineering or something. Yes and no. With the dawn of AI in engineering, sorry to say that, that will burn our educational system upside down. Why should you know the ISO fitting system in the future? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So if you have tolerances stack up and think like, why should you know that in the future? Yes, you click on, on the rod, you click on, 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 on the hole in the system or on, on the bore and ask what kind of fit, what kind of tolerance should I put on that? And the system will tell you. We'll ask some questions, but the system will tell you. So I agree with you. We need to understand that this, what the system proposed is plausible. But the question is, what are we going to teach our future generation of systems engineers? Where do we start? I have no good answer. But your point is right. So learning things, understanding, and I think this is where you're coming from, being able to see whether what we're doing is plausible or not. And this is what we're talking about. Sorry, a little bit long answer here. No problem, we have time. Young, young people are my passion, so <laughs> even though I'm not young anymore. Going further with the, the systems and the integration of the, the system, uh, how do you see the use of AI to uh, further aid planning the agricultural uh, planning? Because you can have a lot of optimizations with the weather, with the crops, soil, etc. Yeah. So AI is so. What's the role of AI in agriculture in the future? We believe it will drive the future. We bought a company that's called Blue River that started to understand how you can use um, cameras to identify whether a plant should be there or whether the plant should not be there. But if it should be there, what does it need? Does it need nurturing or does it, does it need to get some kind of care? This is what we have in production today already. We call it see and spray. So you're driving across your fields the system recognizes, hmm, okay, you look good. You're a corn plant or mice or maize. I'll give you some, I'll give you some fertilizer. Or, nah, you don't need to be here. And then you spot spray it. And the key there is really, if you think about this, what that means, in the past, we sprayed everything. So now we can save about 70, 60 to 70 percent of the, of the, fungicides or pesticides, really focusing on what's there. So every drop of that counts. It's one of the themes we have, every drop counts. Same goes if you think about um, what's the uh, using AI to look at your field or your yield maps and go through that. And what is AI recommending? How much should you, you fertilize? What should you do next? So AI is real and AI is there. It requires a heck lot of computing power I mean, if you see that thing driving across the field, um, most of the server farms 10 years back didn't have that much computing power. So system got more complex, sustainability is the key in this. So yes, AI is there. Just maybe a connected question. Uh, how about the so-called uh, robotic farms or the stacked farms where you can have plantations more inside with UV light and the uh, permaculture, this kind of thing? That's a uh, good question. So it's all about indoor farming, right? Yeah. So is indoor farming something that's going to come? I think in some portions and for some specialty uh, uh, fruits, it's there. It's going to be there um, because it's, it's easier to pick. It's uh, better to control environment. So if you have to rely on the weather, this is sometimes a little bit, hmm. 
question is always how much energy are you putting into this? How much energy does this consume? And can you actually, can the customer regain the cost of the energy by the price for the product? That's possible. It's going to happen more than today. If that's not possible, I believe things will be challenged. We will see some prototype farms. Uh, hopefully they will, they will be able to get the cost back um, right now, I think it's all in, in, in the, in the um, prototype stage, stage. The bulk of production still from open air. Because the outside production systems are so effective right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Udo, for another great presentation, which I like very much. So we learned that your CTO is a systems engineer. And also that uh, a guy from Germany, Christian, is a great systems engineer too. But um, what uh, I think not I am myself, but also we are interested to know how does John Deere deploys, uses MBSE or systems engineering, even systems thinking on a global perspective successfully? What is your best practice approach here for the overall organization, whether it's harvesting, farming, tractors, or even Bitcoin, as you mentioned? Yeah, so it's, it, it, it has two components in it. So the number one component, you have to have people who understand systems engineering. So we are training systems engineers with MIT and Caltech every year, about 4,000 people. So about 50 people every year. And we have been training them over the last eight to 10 years, roughly. So we have a lot of systems engineers, very well-trained systems engineers. And we also have a smaller training for weeks in-house for people who are not really into using systems engineering as heavily as the systems engineers. The other thing is you have to set up your organization to support system engineering. Break down the silos, focus on what's important, have small teams that focus around what you want to deliver. But that goes along where somebody needs to ask for it. And if you don't ask for it, they won't use systems engineering. Why? Why should I use systems engineering if my boss doesn't ask for it? That's a little bit uh, steep, but the point is really is train the people, allow them to use it, but also challenge them to use it, become better. And that's what we do inside Deer. That's why we have a CTO who's a system engineer who challenges me. I challenge you, commented on Christian and others. I challenge the whole organization. What have you done? What is your, one of the, my favorite things is, do we have a trade space analysis on this? What's your Pareto front? What do you recommend? If you don't ask for it, people think it's not important. They won't use it. It's all about asking the right questions in systems engineering. That's what we do. Yeah, thank you, Udo. Also, Mohammad Chami from Mannheim. I'm very glad to see uh, Mannheim artist here. Uh, you mentioned the communication topic. Uh, you were successfully in working with your competitors. Um, being personally having the experience across different sectors. So please share your, uh, let's say, drivers and to convince others here in the room how together we can be stronger, even if we're competitors for a sector like communication. Yeah, it's, that's, that's a tough question. And, and the reason why it's tough, because it requires willingness from everybody to participate in the communication. I mean, you can talk to your to anybody, but if there's nothing coming back, what are you creating? So there's two ways to do this. Number one, um, it's the whole ISO standardization. So if you if you engage in ISO standardization, you get in contact with your uh, with your competitors or with your with your neighbors, and you get engaged with that, and you get the feeling: where do we need to go? What do we need to do? What do we need to standardize? This is actually working very well in agriculture engineering across the globe. Whether it's in India, whether it's in the U.S., whether it's Brazil or in Germany, that works very well. 
Aside from that, there are things like the AEF, so the Agriculture uh, Electrical or Electrical Engineering Foundation. I think that's the right word. You can look it up. You have to gather the people you know, and it usually works very well if you do it with uh, industry organizations like CIMA. I don't know what's a Swiss one. Do we have a Swiss one? I think we do. But anyway, but this is work in those industry associations. That's very important. Get to know the other people, communicate this. And this is not something you do and we meet twice and then we're good. This is something that takes about 10 years to get standardization going in the right way so that one implement can talk to the other tractor or things like that. So it takes a time, but it's also our responsibility to prepare that. And this is what I meant, the business is growing much, much slower than the technology. You may get a standard done, that's not relevant anymore because the technology moved on, right? This will happen more in the future especially when it comes to communication and how do we, what are the protocols we're talking and things like that. Uh, but since you're all systems engineers, take that and talk about that to your colleagues, to your friends. Some of you probably have friends in different companies, studied with them somewhere, talk to them. This is important. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, thank you much for sharing your experience. Uh, I just want to have a very few uh, comments where I feel like uh, what you mentioned for practice and science is very close together, yet also quite far apart, as I notice. Um, so emergence, which you mentioned here, when I introduced emergence this morning, um, we talk a lot about the human factor on the one hand, but also unpredictable living systems yeah. that reach far beyond collecting different new technologies. So we have to differentiate the emergent seas we're talking about. A managing complexity, I mentioned the part of, of language. So if we understand managing complexity as of adapting to it, yes. If we understand as of controlling it, no, for sure not. We won't manage that complexity in that way of command and control. But that's in the engineering souls, so we got to be aware of us. Yeah, we still think we can control complexity. We can't. No. So, so the managing, and that's important. Managing complexity will be somehow playing with, dealing with, enacting with. So we have to understand that managing as a kind of yes, we are part of, and we won't be controlling. Um, and these are important ones. And the third one, maybe, um, uh, <laughs> I hope that for systems thinkers, AI will not merely use to decide if we spray or not a plant because the spraying whatever we plant has that kind. And even putting fertilizer ideally is not the sense. The state of knowledge is that we have different farming systems that are more regenerative where we don't need these practices, but we use machines and AI in different ways. So that's important notions I wanna make. And the last one is I hope that the systems engineering training in the future will involve these kind of nuances very well of being conscious of our language, of connecting with the systems that we live on and thinking, rethinking in the long term our ways we produce and consume in our systems and have the technological development as a partner, but not as a steerer. Obviously, we need and we want to sell, I understand it very well, um, but it should be in, in service for life, not life in service for the machines. And that's maybe just a friendly comment and an invitation for common discourse, which I think is very important. Thank you. And the emergence, we need to understand how we talk about that, what that is, also complexity, we all concerned with that. Um, on the spraying side, of course, it would be fantastic if we don't have to spray, right? It's it's you're 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 introducing something to the system that is not or that should not be there, and we all agree with that. Unfortunately, we have to feed a lot of people, and the technology we have available right now. This is the best choice. Right now, I'm not saying in ten years from now. Maybe in ten years from now, we have smart robots who go in and say, "I'll clip you." 
right? It would be like an animal would come in and, and eat the wheat, right? So it, it would be something different. So this is, I think, something what we have to think about. What are the steps? How do we progress forward? Can we, and I, that's what I really liked about your, your presentation this morning. Can we envision the future? Can we work on the future? Can we talk about this lovely blue planet, which is ours? And how do we move forward with that? And really understand what that is. And I would like to share something Thought I had it in here, but I think I do have it in here because it's the John Deere purpose. We run so that life can leap forward, a leap forward. That's our purpose. Are we perfect? No way. Trying to be better every day? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my uh, question is quite technical. Uh, and sorry for my ignorance. Do you still have self-driving tractors or self-driving machines? Self-driving machines or self-driving yeah, tractors? autonomous tractors. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have autonomous tractors in the field as we speak. They do tillage work in mm -hmm. Minnesota and in Kansas, I believe. So we have the legal rights to operate these machines without a person sitting in the seat. And actually, my main question is how you communicate with the competition, let's say, how you don't hit each other on the... Oh, this is nothing we want to communicate with the competition. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> how, is how to do autonomous vehicles, that's our business. So the question is, uh, do you follow any standards, laws that you, you work on? It? In agriculture, it's a little bit different than on the road. First of all, uh, we don't have all these other cars coming. We just have to make sure that everything in front of us is okay, that you can stop the tractor in time. So I wouldn't say life is a little bit easier for us, but it is. So therefore, um, since we are so far ahead of our competition, we can actually set the standards, what we need to do. And keep in mind what you know with um, reliability and responsibility to the products. That's different what we know here in Europe than what it is in the US. It's much, much sharper in the US. You have to make sure that your products are safe, that nothing can happen to that. And I would say we're at the cutting edge where you say we can operate that. There's no way somebody gets harmed. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. Are we perfect? We'll see. But I think we are at the cutting edge. Thank you so much. Thank you.